The Unshackled Waves, episode 126. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Federal Parliament resumed for 2018 this week, but the big story was the worldwide stock markets crashing before somewhat smoothing out before the end of the week. Barnaby Joyce was revealed to be expecting a baby with his staffer, whom he had an affair with. New Liberal Senator Jim Mullen had a baptism of fire uh, when he was criticised for previously sharing Britain First videos. Also, the citizenship saga continues with Labor's Susan Lamb, the latest MP under pressure to refer herself to the High Court. To discuss these various developments, we are joined by the Unshackled senior editor, Damien Ferry. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Damien, welcome back to the show. It's good to be here, Tim. Now, uh, as we both know, Parliament resumed this week, but the, probably the, the biggest story, well, not just in Australia and the world, was the stock market crashing uh, somewhat. So in the United States on Monday, the Dow Jones uh, closed at 1,175 points down or losing 4.6% of its value. That uh, translated to Australia's AXX on Tuesday. It lost 1.6% of its value. Uh, fell, fell by uh, fell down to six thousand and twenty six points, and on Thursday the uh, Dow Jones took another tumble. It lost uh, one thousand and thirty three points, or lost four point two percent of its value. Now both the uh, uh, Dow Jones and AXX they bounced back uh, before the uh, end of the week. I know that's a lot of. Uh, statistical financial jargon for uh, a lot of our audience, but it was uh, quite a uh, shock to a lot of us because, you know, we, especially listening to a lot of the, the US commentary, we, we were told, you know, their economy was uh, going along, you know, really well. The, uh, you know, jo- uh, jo- there had been continued uh, uh, job growth, the, the jobs had stopped being outsourced, and the, obviously the big company uh, tax cut. So it was a real shock to the system. Yeah, I, I mean, as soon as uh, Trump got into power, it actually, um, the economy was, was going really well and there was a lot of talk about how, how good it was going and how uh, how much on a rise everything was, go- um, you know, jobs, as you mentioned, and, uh, you know, just um, all the investment, opportunity, everything was going really well and um, it's just um, all of a sudden taken a bit of a, a, bit of a drop um, and hopefully it ends up recovering sooner rather than later. Uh, but the uh, biggest fall was in uh, Bitcoin, which uh, uh, from its peak of uh, $20,000 in uh, early February, US dollars, I should say, it fell to uh, 6000 US uh, dollars, uh, losing 70% of its value. And I've heard, you know, being in the libertarian movement for so long, all these Bitcoin nerds say, oh, you know, it's the, the, the greatest thing, you know, ever. It's going to be the, the future and, you know, it's only going to go up and up. And then we just saw, phew, it just just you know crash right down yeah that didn't surprise me at all i actually um never trusted it when it even came out it uh it wasn't something sustainable that seemed to be really a long-term thing um that would last and um i definitely would rather keep my cash any time of the day and it's it's also worth uh you know uh, pointing out that uh you know, obviously Trump, uh, you know, took credit for the, um, you know, improved economic situation in the United States. So when the, you know, stock market somewhat uh, crashed this week, uh, he was inevitably blamed for it because, you know, when you take credit for something and then it goes down, then, you know, of course, you know, you're, you're going to cop the inevitable backlash. Uh, so, you know, Trump, you know, it's, although, you know, he wants to take credit for the, you know, the, the situation, obviously, you know, the, being the being the person in charge, you're going to cop the blame whether it's within your control or not. Because it definitely, you know, Trump he can create the economic conditions, you know, through his policy, but ultimately you can't control what the stock market does. Yeah, well, they've only got certain controls 
um, over how everything works, the, the economy and all. And I mean, um, it's just typical of politicians to, to do such a thing and um, claim when things are going well and when they're, they're not going so well, they'll um, put the blame on a previous government administration, for instance, or, uh, or some other factors. But um, in the end, really, it, um, it, it, I mean, they only have a certain, um, a, a certain um, influence over what happens and it's not really big enough unless they, they were to create some disastrous policies um, to cause such things. But really it, it, it isn't something that, that really, that they have such a position that they can um, either do so well or so, so bad. I mean, it, it's all the other factors as well. And they only use um, such things to prop themselves up. Like when things are going well, when they're not going so well, it's somebody else to blame. A lot of people uh, in searching for an explanation for the stock market tumble uh, said that it was likely uh, because people believe the, the new Federal Reserve uh, chair, uh, Jerome Powell, would uh, raise interest rates, which have been you know, kept at record lows pretty much uh, since the global financial crisis hit uh, 2008. So there's been, for the past decade, this you know easy uh, money and you know whenever... Uh, rates uh, you know go up that uh, that hurts investment but um you know i'm an adherent to the austrian school of economics and damien i know you're somewhat uh uh adhere to some of it as well that you know cheap easy money it inevitably leads to you know a bubble economy a, a mal uh, application of capital and inevitably mm. leads to you know a crash or or a correction and so the austrian economist was saying you know look, uh, look this is you know we should have let the economy you know reset in in 2008 instead of just you know pumping it up for uh, another bust and you know although you know i i've me wishful thinking, you know, thought, you know, the good times are, you know, finally ahead of us, you know, we're seeing the, the situation uh, improve, you know, the events of this week have sort of made me think, you know, we still, uh, we still can't, you know, as the Austrians say, escape the laws of economics. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's one of those things that when, thing, uh, when, when the economy um, gets pushed so much, and um, you see rates going down so much. You see, um, you know, like it, it almost uh, leads, like you said, to a particular bubble. You get the property prices going up at, at record highs. And it, it leads to a situation where um, it's not sustainable. It, um, it, it will eventually have to, have to drop. And, and, and then people are going to get hurt a lot worse. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, um, I mean, it's quite good to have um, interest rates low, of course, and, um, and to, to have people in a position where they can borrow and, um, and you know, be able to uh, buy investments, of course, and, and everything like that. But in the same token, uh, if you are um, uh, putting things at, at a level that makes it over time that things are just going too well and too fast, then... Overall, it, it's it's not going to sustain itself. I mean, you'd have to be uh, thinking the best approaches for modest gains or, or modest drops in rates um, over time, and, and not such a, a you know small gap that it happens so soon and so fast. Because now we're seeing a, a situation where not not everyone can get into the market and make investments because they they just can't afford. Uh, the prices on the on on properties, whether it be commercial, uh, residential, and um, in in saying that, the, the, they're going to have to put the interest rates up sooner or later, and it's going to happen soon. And and when they do put the rates up, for all those people that have borrowed uh, big amounts, they're going to really suffer, and they're going to hit hard. Whereas in the past, um, whether they were if if they were able to take an approach where they weren't um, taking out such a, um, a big amount um, when they were borrowing, they wouldn't be in a situation where they, they would lose properties or lose so much money, whereas now it's bound to happen that a lot of people are going to lose and they're going to lose big as well because of um, a rise of interest rates. It's just a lot of people won't maintain. And, and people these days also... Um, you don't have the the old school sort of uh, thought that um, say a lot of uh, the boomers and whatnot had back in the day, 
um, a lot of people these days, if they want something, they'll they'll purchase it and they will borrow um, up to such a big percentage of, of the sum. And and I mean, they'll be paying on, paying it off for decades and decades. So in saying that, eventually it's going to be a position where, well, as soon as the, the their property drops, the banks are just going to take their property off them because they won't be able to afford it and it's not going to be worth as much. Their, their mortgage is obviously going to be higher than what the property's worth and that's it and then they lose everything so it's yeah it's going to be sad to see Australian politics had its first uh, sex scandal in quite a while. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Barnaby Joyce, it was revealed uh, by the Daily Telegraph that uh, his former media advisor, uh, Vicky Campion, who uh, he'd been having an affair with for uh, quite a while now, was uh, pregnant with his child. Uh, Campion is 33, uh, Joyce is 50. He uh, was uh, married with uh, four children, and it certainly uh, caused a, a stir in Canberra, whether, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, journalists and, you know, some in the public have been, you know, tut tutting how, you know, dare you, you know, report on, you know, a politician's uh, private life. But of course, uh, uh, you know, it's a bit different with uh, Barnaby Joyce for two reasons, because he did sell himself as, you know, a politician who believed in, you know, family values. He was, you know, vocally opposed to uh, same-sex marriage for a number of years, but also be because uh, Campion was uh, his staffer. And, you know, when the, you know, affair was, uh, you know, revealed to the office, she was uh, shifted to uh, another job with uh, National Party Senator uh, Matt Canavan, or the position was, in fact, uh, created for her, which you know, a lot of people have frowned upon. And then when Matt Canavan had to uh, resign because uh, he was up before the High Court because of citizenship, she was then moved to uh, another uh, Nationals MP, Damien Drum's office. So uh, there, there seemed to be that, you know, she was getting, you know, special treatment because, you know, she was, you know, sleeping with the, uh, the leader. So, you know, even though, um, you know, like journalists and, you know, the, the Labour Party are saying, oh, this is, you know, a private matter. Um, that's They've been saying that basically because there's a whole bunch of, you know, MPs who, you know, having affairs and, you know, the, the journalists know it as well and, you know, don't, uh, don't report it. And so, you know, the, the public you basically have heard this news and all of them are saying, you know, what the hell is going on in Canberra? Yeah, well, it's nothing new. It's um, something that happens quite often, but we don't hear about it. And I think that journalists really, um, that it's their duty that if they're aware of such things, that they should be reporting it. And um, if they don't, then we have to ask, why is that the case that they're not? And, I mean, are they getting any sort of um, special treatments? Uh, are they are they being told to, to keep quiet, for instance? Um, I mean, it's, there's so many scenarios that they, they can play in my head. But, like, uh, the way I see it is that if they are not um, mentioning such things, then, I mean, uh, that can lead to corruption quite easily because um, they can be bribed to not say a word about certain aspects or of what people are, are getting up to and i mean the public need to know um who it is that or what it is that our elected uh, officials are doing because these people are, are people that um we look up to that represent us and they're supposed to have a, a, a moral high ground um it seems that a lot of the case that isn't the, that isn't true and that they um if anything are, are some of the worst offenders but Really, I mean, this is the problem of modern day politics. I mean, these people are supposed to be moral high figures. Now, in, re in regards to Joyce's situation, like you mentioned, it does affect him worse. Now, it's not fair, but it's realistic because at the end of the day, when you are a conservative uh, right wing MP, and you are involved in an affair of some sorts. Obviously, you are somebody that runs on family values platform. Then you are going to be criticised harder than, say, someone from the Greens that did that because someone from the Greens would, I mean, we would expect that from them. I mean, you know, it's just the way it is. I mean, their voters wouldn't care. I mean, it's just we'd expect somebody like that to, to do something like that. Um, whereas on the other scale... 
if somebody from the Greens, for instance, uh, was caught littering rubbish, then that would be a big deal because they're supposed to be environmentalists, whereas if someone on the conservative side did, nobody would care. So this is, uh, at the end of the day, we, uh, um, we have an idea on our politicians, who they are supposed to be as people, and, w- and we basically hold them up and say, whatever you say you are and whatever you, you say your platform is, you have to live that you can't speak one thing and then do another so in regards to Joyce if he claims to be a family man then he has to stick by his values he cannot in his private life behind closed doors be doing things that are quite opposite to the views that he portrays out in the public and his actions it's had a pretty devastating effect on his family I mean when his wife found out you know she kicked him out of the the family home and he had to go and stay with uh, his sister, and uh, you know, after this was reported by the Daily Telegraph, his uh, wife Natalie released a press statement, you know, saying, you know, how you know hurt uh, she was about this. You know, I basically, you know, sacrificed, you know, my career to, you know, support him in politics, and you know, uh, me and you know our four children, you know, we sacrificed a lot of family time as well, so you know he could be, you know, a politician. So you know that you know, the family is, you know, not in a, a good place. And, you know, that that's not the, the message that uh, you want to be sending. And I think, you know, Joyce's excuse, well, you know, like nobody is, you know, perfect. Well, a lot of us aren't perfect, but, you know, don't do things like this. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's a good excuse to use. I mean, we're, we're not perfect. We, we, we might, we might uh, make mistakes, but this is a big mistake. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is life... Uh, um, you know, a big life uh, change, you know, and um, I mean, this has changed lives in his family. It's it's not just uh, a, a small mistake of, uh, you know, saying the wrong thing or, you know, doing something silly. I mean, this is, uh, you know, made a big impact on his family. It's, um, it's a lot bigger than what he's making it out to be. And it just makes me um, very um, wary when, when you see all these politicians, even on, on both sides, coming out and supporting him and saying, oh, it's the wrong thing to go reporting on the private lives, we shouldn't do it. Because at the end of the day, a lot of them are involved in this sort of thing and um, they're all scared that they're going to be the next ones. And I think they should be scared because we as the public should know who they are as real people. We shouldn't have this fake... Uh, image in public and then in private it's a totally different person we 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 should really know who these people are so i i think um when you see all of them sticking by each other it just shows how corrupt um these people are you know they they, they don't have any values really and you know it's um it's just a big brothel up in canberra by the look of it and these, you know, journalists in the Canberra Press Gallery, they have to decide, you know, if they're actually, you know, journalists or they're running a protection racket for their, you know, political mates who they rely on for their, you know, stories and leaks. I know if I certainly had the the information in front of me that, you know, MPs were, you know, off having affairs, you know, the Unshackled would definitely report it. Yes, well, well that's why we are much different to the mainstream media that we, we, we don't uh, we're not owned by anybody like we're not um, we're not told what we can or cannot say we are basically you know free thinkers that um, believe in principles that want to do what's right for people and for the country and that is why we have a, a, a big base of, of supporters of people that um, class us as a, a popular alternative and I mean I uh, One thing to note is that this is what happens when people have too much power. They believe they can get away with anything. And this is why those kind of um, issues like affairs, um, scandals, I mean, a lot of scandals end up being, you know, uh, um, sexual scandals, deviant uh, things that people have done in the past or whatever. And it's quite a common reality because these people are put in a position where they've got power and they feel like, they are unstoppable. They, they can do these things without um, being touched because of their position. So, I mean, they have to have a bit of a reality check here and, and think, you know, you, you are no different to any ordinary person. I mean, you are working in your position. If anything, you guys have to do a better job in, in keeping your nose clean and making sure 
that um, you are moral citizens. I mean, um, nobody would care if, you know, um, a, you know, someone down the road did something like that. But, I mean, someone on TV that everybody's, you know, looking up to and, you know, um, in their head thinking, oh, yeah, this person is working for us and representing us. And then they do something like that. So, I mean, and not only that, I mean, if he's going to do some some damage to his own family, then, you know, what would he do to each country? I mean, this, this is something that people think of. Um, I mean, nobody in their right mind that, that is a good person would, would want to hurt their family. So as soon as you get a politician doing some harm to their family, then you start to question um, their position as to what what kind of harm they could possibly do to to their country and their jobs. So it's a very very hard circumstance, and I'm I'm just hoping that a lot of a lot more of this comes out in the open so people are aware of it. Well, uh, some Labor MPs, such as uh, Tanya Plibersek, have said, you know, we will pursue it. You know, if their you know taxpayer money was abused, which uh, the the government's responded, you know, if you pursue this in any way or form, you know, we will make sure that you know your sides, you know, exposed mm. in all of this. And you know, there there is the obvious example of you know Tony Burke's uh, uh, relationship uh, uh, with with a staffer. So it's happened on. Uh, happened on both sides and so there there is there, there's been this pact between the major parties of you know mutually assured destruction we don't we won't you know t- t- you know tell about each other's you know uh behind the scenes relationships otherwise you know we're all stuffed exactly and and that's the problem of of modern day politics they're not working for us they're working for themselves they're trying to um you know like like you were saying you know um protect uh these particular activities and um, cause a bit of a racket here. And, you know, I mean, it's terrible. And, and any person on the street and you, that you talk to would, would say this, this is just disgusting behaviour and it's something that we need to know um, and be made aware of. And for, for people on, on both sides to have some sort of pact, I mean, that's, it's, it's just such a bad, bad thing. I mean, it's, um, it's just showing that no matter what side of politics um, you know, what parties are out there, that they only work for themselves and not for the country. There's been calls to actually uh, ban uh, relationships uh, between uh, MPs and staffers. Now, I actually think that's going, you know, too far. I mean, you know, they're, you know we're still talking about, you know, at the end of the day, you know, consenting adults. I mean, you can't, you know, ban mm. those relationships. It's funny after the, you know, love is love, you can't uh, help, you know, who, who you fall in love with campaign. You know, now, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, and apparently there's these uh, rules in the, the corporate world as well that, you know, if there's a, a supposed power imbalance in a workplace relationship you know you're not you're not allowed to mm. go into a relationship with them so it's it's interesting <laughs> that you know we uh, apparently some relationships are still you know taboo i think that you know these mm. if there are these relationships they should be exposed for you know the public mm. to you know judge you know whether it is or is not appropriate and certainly with joyce for the two reasons that you know we've mentioned the fact that you know he is you know moral failing and also the mm-hmm. fact that you know it was you know she did get you know preferential treatment you know all you know, being shifted all throughout this and uh this weekend the story got even weirder that uh, apparently joyce and uh vicky campion they're now living together rent free mm-hmm. in a, a home owned by a local uh New England businessman Greg Maguire, which he's declared as a free gift on uh, his uh, parliamentary uh, register. And so it's like, wow, you cheat on your wife and get a free accommodation. Well, nothing's free. So, <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I mean, it would be interesting to know why, why um, that businessman did what he did for him. I mean, there has to be some sort of favour or some sort of... Uh, you know, I mean, um, without getting into conspiracies, but I mean, it's just, um, I mean, nobody does something for you for nothing. It's just, you know, the way it works, especially businessmen. I mean, they're not going to give away things for nothing. So, I mean, um, uh, another thing is to note that um, some people might call it a conflict of interest um, for these relationships to occur, but you do have a good point that um, um, the people that are, you know, consenting and that, um, you know, for instance, with the, the love is love tag that, um, you know, they fancy somebody and, and whatnot and um, they happen to be in that position. Uh, I think it is worse, of course, um, 
when the the people involved are already married with other people. Um, and I think that's the main issue. I don't think uh, many people would really care too much, um, even though some might might think it might be conflict in interest, but I think most people wouldn't really care too much if uh, Joyce had um, been with um, this woman, um, his staffer, um, on a normal sort of relationship basis without him having mar- been married and having kids. I think that's where the scandal lies that most people are uh, are really outraged by. And uh, uh, since uh, this weekend, the story just keeps getting more and more bizarre and there's, you know, all, all of all, all of these, you know, reports about, you know, what happened, you know, behind the scenes and, you know, the various, you know, shifting uh, campion around. There's, uh, it's actually broken tonight. There are members of the government who, uh, you know, are, call, are calling on, you know, Barnaby Joyce or, you know, Malcolm Turnbull to ask him uh, to resign, saying he, you know, his position's untenable after this. And I, I do agree as well. I mean, it's a huge distraction for the government. And it obviously, you know, with, you know, Barnaby Joyce with, you know, creating that sort of, you know, personal crisis for himself it does you know people are it's fair enough for them to you know ask the question you know is he you know the right person to you know continue to be you know the deputy you know the acting prime minister when malcolm mm, turnbull mm. is not in the country and let's not forget he is not the most popular person in the the national party anymore i mean uh, there was a lot of uh you know, bitterness over the the recent uh, reshuffle where uh, Darren Chester from Victoria was uh, dumped from cabinet for the, you know, it appeared to be the crime of uh, helping uh, elect uh, Bridget McKenzie as the deputy when Barnaby Joyce wanted uh, Matt Canavan, which seems to be a pretty petty, you know, reason to, you know, dump somebody from uh, cabinet. And, le- and let's also remember that, you know, Barnaby, he's, you know, uh, ma- made an effort to, you know, shit all over, you know, George Christensen, you know, Pauline Hanson, mm-hmm. and basically mm-hmm. be, you know, Malcolm Turnbull's, you know, best buddy. They've, you know, actually struck up quite a friendship well that's true i think joyce has changed a lot i mean um i remember um back in the day um under abbott and and even when he was in opposition he was um really seen as a straight talker somebody like a you know like a catter or a hansen and someone that's really you know conservative that that uh, represented people outspoken but ever since getting into government, and especially under Turnbull, he's changed a lot and he's become a lot more uh, moderate. He's been more um, uh, critical of, uh, of figures um, that you mentioned that, that, that are a little bit more fringe. And, um, it's, yeah, it just seems to, yeah, and we don't know why this is the case, really. And, and that's why he's had a lot of uh, people criticise him. Uh, the base aren't liking him as much as they used to. Um and we just have to ask why why it is the case that he's uh, made such a, a drastic move um, in, in his way of thinking and his approach to things, really. New Liberal Senator Jim Molan had a, a baptism of fire in his first week in the Senate. We have to remember that uh, he was uh, elected to the Senate via a countback because uh, Nationals uh, Senator Fiona Nash, she got knocked out for Jewish citizenship by the High Court. Then the next on the ticket, Holly Hughes also got knocked out by the High Court because she had taken a job with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which means she was uh, receiving an Office of Profit under the Crown. Uh, so Jim Mullen, former uh, Major General, he, he he's a popular person, or not, uh, not just in the uh, Liberal Party, but in, in the uh, Australian community uh, at large. Uh, the, the media was able to... Uh, dig up his uh, Facebook page where he uh, had shared last year two videos uh, from the organisation Britain First uh, purporting to show uh, Muslim violence in uh, Europe and of course uh, Britain First were made famous uh, when Donald Trump uh, retweeted uh, some of their videos and so this uh, set off a whole um, you know media shitstorm like you know uh, and it was the it was Labour they uh, 
pursued the government uh, over this in question time, but it was really the Greens who went way over the top, you know, saying he shared, you know, white supremacist uh, pro uh, propaganda. And then they went even further and questioned his time as uh, chief of coalition forces uh, in Iraq uh, over, hi uh, over his handling of the assault on the Iraqi town of uh, Fallujah and basically accused him of being a, a war criminal. So basically raised, you know, they didn't just stick to the, you know, sharing, you know, fascist propaganda. They actually, you know, went even further and decided to dig up all this Iraq stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a sad situation. I mean, um, f first of all, I wouldn't call Britain First um, an extremist um, group, to be honest. I mean, I've seen a lot of things out there in the public domain, and I think um, the, a lot of the, the Greens... Um, views would be a lot more extreme on the other side of things than Britain first would. I mean, um, just a patriot group, of course, that are uh, looking out for their people and um, raising the issues that are of concern. And um, the Greens did, um, you know, of course, use buzzwords such as white supremacist and, and racist and all, all the rest of it that you normally use and went further and I mean, myself and, and you uh, weren't fans of, um, you know, the wars in Iraq or anything by any means, but um, to call somebody that was doing his job just, um, you know, a minor player over there, um, a war criminal, that, that's just um, such an extreme thing to say. And, I mean, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just really crazy language, really. It's just undisciplined. It's um, it's just showing how, how bizarre and... Um, unprofessional the greens are and um and how they should be really irrelevant to society to be honest and to uh, uh, Jim Mullen's credit, he refused to apologise for sharing uh, the videos. He, although he did say that you know Britain First was an appalling you know organisation, I think that's basically the only mistake that he made. Because yeah, right, Brit uh, Britain First, you know they're they're a very uh, you know confrontational organisation, but no, they're definitely mm. you know not not racist. They're you know mm. Mm. if you look at their you know website and you know what they put out on uh, social media, you know they're about you know defending british values uh, you know christian mm. uh heritage yeah so you know if you're going to call them you know white supremacist fascists you're going to have to call a whole bunch of people uh that uh, uh as well and uh, also jim Mullen didn't take kindly uh, because most of the greens were smart enough to insult jim Mullen inside the parliament where you're protected by parliamentary mm. privilege but adam bant mm. decided to on sky news call him a coward and a war criminal and jim Mullen <laughs> basically Basically said, you know, please apologize or uh, I'll sue you. Now, you know, I don't like the whole, um, you know, threatening to sue people. Uh, I, I'm with uh, Andrew Bold on this that, you know, we should just, you know, ha have a society of free speech. But yeah, Jim Mullen mm -hmm. said, you know, wasn't going to uh, cop that. And he managed to get an apolo uh, apology out of Adam Ban on this on the second mm -hmm. Uh, trying, which is, wow, to get a Greens person to admit they were wrong, that's really rare. Yeah, I, I agree with you that I think that, um, I mean, ideally people should be able to be free to say whatever they want. I, know I, don't, think, uh, I don't think people should be sued. But I think um, Jim Mullen um, doing what he did was, um, I, I, think, I think, more setting out a, a point of principle here that um, he didn't want, um, well, he wanted the Greens to understand that they, they can't be setting double standards. They can't be, um, um, you know, insulting and, you know, um, and, and saying outrageous things. But then all of a sudden when someone on the right says something, it's, you know, the worst thing in the world. So, I mean, I think that it was great that he did pull that move because it was, um, it did humiliate the Greens, make them look stupid. And um, I think that it was really done more for the point, uh, just a point to prove rather than that he was really serious about, about suing him because of someone, you know, that believes in free speech. I don't think, you know, um, anyone would really care what they're called or, or because, I mean, that goes against the principle. So I, I think, yeah, ideally, I mean, people should be free to speak and, you know, um, call each other things. But the the problem is with the Greens is that you can't, say anything directed to them because you know free speech only works the other way around for them and that's why he was exposing the double standard and i think it was a great thing that he did that
Oh yeah, Sarah Hansen Young. She doesn't like you questioning her uh, travel entitlements. Like, how dare you criticize my <laughs> whale watching trip? You're an angry uh, old white uh, white man. Uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I-, I was also pleased not just with uh, Molan's you know refusal to you know uh, you know beg for forgiveness, but also the uh, you know coalition was uh, resolute in you know defending him. Uh, and you know you have to remember that you know Molan you know he. Uh, He's, you know, not uh, the, you know, factional warlords in the in the Liberal Party, you know, don't like him. That's why they put him number seven on the the coalition uh, Senate ticket uh, back at the 2016 mm. federal election. Uh, so, you know, he has a lot of enemies in the Liberal Party, but it was good that they, you know, really stuck up for him on his first weekend, you know, would not, you know, have a bar of, um, you know, Labour and the Greens and, you know, even Turnbull, you know, the one of the most, you know, le- <laughs> left-wing uh, Liberals mm. there is was, you know, qu- called him, you know, Great Australian and, you know, and obviously... Uh, the unshackled we decided to gauge public opinion as well with uh, our own poll uh, asking uh, do you uh, su- uh, support Jim Mullen sharing Britain first videos and uh, yeah. the response was overwhelming I mean we had uh, over uh, 2,300 votes and 97% mm. was yes and only 3% was no mm-hmm no, that, that's a great result, and it shows that a lot of people are waking up and, uh, and you know, um, starting to accept other people's point of views rather than um, to think that we should have some sort of, um, you know, totalitarian kind of concept that, um, you know, people um, should be shut down whenever they uh, have particular views that might not be considered mainstream or, uh, or fashionable and that people are um, free to speak their minds, you know, and, and give a bit of a... a differing opinion which is great because it um it gives us diverse views that we can then um discuss and have discussions with um i mean um, i'm not surprised that um the coalition overwhelmingly backed him because i don't think they had any choice regardless so even if uh some some of the um more left-leaning uh members did have issues with him but i mean publicly they'd have to back him because to, to come out and, and use that issue, that issue and uh, to call him out would only be kicking a home goal, really. It wouldn't really be uh, worth the, the Liberal Party's best interest to do so. So um, hopefully he has the, um, the backing of the, of the members uh, that are legit, though, like that aren't just sort of in public view that, you know, they're, they're doing, you know, the right thing because it's in the party's interest, but they actually do believe that he did the right thing, which he did, you know, to just uh, share videos on his own page uh, and for the media to go and dig that up, of course, it just shows, isn't, isn't it funny? I mean, it shows the hypocrisy that they're willing to go on a, a member's page and make a big fuss out of um, out of um, someone that shares Britain First videos, but then whenever it comes to sex scandals, I mean, apart from the Barnaby Joyce one, they're all hush-hush about it, see? So... And I would think that it's in the public interest more that people knew about a sex scandal rather than um, somebody that just shared a video. So, I mean, it just shows, you know, uh, how how um, how the media are very, very hypocritical there. And uh, there's a lot of uh, different interest groups. And, and you know, obviously, you know, um, people on the right side of politics uh, are always constantly getting um, the wrong end of the of the stick there. So the latest MP to be in the spotlight over uh, dual citizenship questions is uh, Labor's uh, Susan Lamb, who is the member for uh, Longman, which is uh, in the northern outer suburbs of uh, Brisbane, which uh, the Labor Party uh, only just won off uh, Wyatt Roy in the 2016 uh, federal election. Uh, Now, she, uh, uh, before that election, tried to renounce her British citizenship because her uh, father uh, was uh, born in Britain. Uh, her, fa- her father's now uh, deceased and the uh, British uh, t- 
authorities, they asked for uh, further documentation so they could assess whether she was a British citizenship or not. And uh, she was asked to provide her parents a uh, marriage uh, certificate, which she didn't do. And she uh, made a uh, statement to the House of Representatives this week saying that she couldn't get the uh, marriage certificate because she's estranged from her mother because... Uh, according to Lamb, she abandoned her at school one day when she was six and, and never came back. And so she hasn't spoken to her mother since. And so it's too awkward for her to uh, somehow get the marriage certificate. And this was designed to, you know, tell a sob story and, uh, you know, tell the government to, you know, back off its tragic situation. Well, the um, government wasn't, wasn't having a bar of it saying, you know, the law still applies. She's still, you know, technically a, a, a dual citizen. She should go to the high court. Yeah, I, th I think that's the case. I mean, um, every, every time that somebody applies or, or is running for a seat in Parliament, say, I mean, people have to do their homework and make sure that they have all the right requirements to be eligible. So this, um, so Susan Lamb should have done her, her work to, to make sure that she had everything in check. And regardless of the, the story that she's giving, uh, it was no excuse. I mean, everybody has the same rights here and everybody needs to follow the same rules. So, I mean, no, no case, no, no matter how devastating it is, really, um, you know, I mean, if you give special privilege to someone, then you'd have to give it to somebody else because they'll say, well, that person had it. So you have to have one rule set in stone for everybody. And her uh, stepmother has actually uh, come out and said, you know, that story's, you know, not uh, entirely true. Like, uh, what actually happened that day was uh, her mother arranged for a friend to um, uh, pick her up and, you know, she did see her mother, you know, after uh, that day. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Labour got her to make that statement. You know, it was it was a political tool which the, the government uh, didn't fall for, which, you know, you know, just because you've got, you know, a tragic story doesn't mean the, the rule of law, you know, uh, doesn't apply. That's exactly right. I mean, everybody has issues in, in life that they have to um, go through, but we have to, at the end of the day, still follow the certain laws in place, rules. And, um, I mean, we, we can't make special treatment of, of anyone because once you do, then people are always going to point at that and say, well, then why shouldn't I be, um, you know, my situation um, be also counted and and looked at differently. It's it's just um, ridiculous, really. Uh, there's no excuse involved. Should have made sure she had everything in place and done the right thing, and then she wouldn't be in in the position that she's currently in. And I think it's hypocritical of the government to say, you know, we're going to pursue her because you know the uh, a tragic story, uh, sh uh, you know, shouldn't. The law shouldn't be disregarded, but oh, you can't go near, you know, Josh Frydenberg or Jason Falinski because their, um, you know, parents, you know, survived, you know, the Second World War and the the Holocaust. So, you know, how dare you, uh, you know, go after them? Like you say, you, you know, you want to still go after, you know, Labor, but saying your own people are off limits because of, you know, tragic, you know, circumstance. That's double standard. Yeah, definitely. And like I was saying before, I mean, the the law is in place and it should. Um, people, no matter who they are and what experience they've gone through, I mean, um, they have to obey this or abide this law, you know. Like, there, there's no particular circumstance that um, people can, you know, cry over and, and, and make sob stories over. I mean, fair enough, nobody um, asked for, um, you know, these circumstances to take place, whether it was Susan Lamb or whether it was the, the war stories of uh, Frydenberg and Falinski, but... At the end of the day, it doesn't doesn't matter. I mean, these guys should have um, also, in their circumstance, uh, um, made sure that they did their homework and and made sure that they weren't citizens of other dual citizens of other countries either. So they they just can't, um, you know, that is a double standard, and they should be also questioned um, or anyone else in this situation, no matter what situation they go in, they need to be questioned and make sure that they're you know, brought to the High Court and then to allow them to decide on the future of the MP. 
it still shows that even you know six months after this you know dual citizenship crisis uh occurred that both major parties are still playing politics with it both are trying to knock out the other side's mps and trying to protect their own i mean you know where weren't we supposed to have like this you know audit which was supposed to you know take the politics out of it and so we could solve it and move on yet you know bo both sides they you know it's it's still the same uh, you know, they're, they're trying to see, you know, what they can get away with. It's exactly right, and they're using it. Um, I think that there's a lot of people, for instance, um, in the major parties that uh, have information that there might be um, other members on the other side of politics that are dual citizens and they just aren't coming out yet with it because they want to use it uh, at the right circumstances. Maybe, um, for instance, if an election campaign down the track was called, then it would be, um, you know, great timing to um, come out and, and, and say that someone on the other side was a dual citizen, for instance, because it would be damaging um, in such a campaign. So, I mean, I think we're going to hear a lot more of it. And I think there are people in there that know they're dual citizens that haven't come out and that people on the opposite side to them know they're dual citizens and they haven't said anything yet because they're waiting for the right moment to strike. Um, and th this is just how, how ridiculous it is. But I, it is the realistic form of how politics works. So they, they will always try and... Uh, um, make sure that when they have information on, on people that it's used at, at a particular time. And like Barnaby Joyce's uh, story, people knew about this many, like, ages ago, but it's only come out now. So um, they will release the, the, the facts and come out with details when it suits them and when they think it's the right time to pounce on something. Well, it's certainly been a surprising uh, news week. We, we didn't expect to be talking about these things when the week, week began. I think we'd be fools to predict what's going to happen in the uh, next week. But I appreciate you, Damien, uh, taking the time to uh, talk with me and dissect the week. And uh, we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. And it was great to be with you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Our next upcoming event is the Free Speech Rally, hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be held in Melbourne, uh, outside the State Library of Victoria on Saturday the uh, 24th of February at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness, so I hope that many of you can make it. Also happening on the same weekend is Dave Pillell from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018, on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers including Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.